Okay, final question. Let's have a look at this one together. It's going to be mechanics. An object of mass 80 kilograms, that's important, falls from rest under a gravitational acceleration of g and air resistance of 0.2 v newtons, v for velocity. Find the velocity of the object after time t, find the limiting or the terminal velocity of the object and find out how far has the object fallen after time t. Alright, so how do we go about this question? The first thing that was problematic for students when they were having a go at, what is this, C? When they were having a go at C was that they failed to read the question carefully um, and notice that the particular forces that are at play here have been very, very carefully described to you, right? So when you say um, the force is equal to mass times acceleration, what are the accelerations in this situation? Well, there's going to be um, the acceleration that's due to gravity, and then there's going to be an acceleration that's due to this air resistance, right? Now, if you just draw, again, a very, very simple diagram here, okay? You are going to have um, gravity pulling you downwards, and then you're going to have air resistance pushing against you, pushing upwards, because this is an object that is falling from rest. Now, think about this, right? Um, this is an object of mass 80 kilograms, so therefore it's going to have a weight force of 80 times gravity. And um, gravity has not, it, the constant hasn't been defined as 10 or 9.8 or anything like that. So it's 80 G, right? What about the air resistance? It's going to be uh, 0.2 times the velocity. The faster it's going, the more air resistance it is experiencing. Now, when you have a look at that, I want you to look carefully, right? You can see that mass is part of the gravity, the gravitational acceleration, but mass in this question is not part of the uh, air resistance uh, acceleration, right? It's 0.2 V, and this is often the case, right? Um, often air resistance has nothing to do with how heavy something is, it's to do with how big it is, right? Um, have a think about a parachute, yeah? A parachute is the same mass when it is folded up as when it is, you know, released. Um, but even though mass does, its mass doesn't change, its shape changes. And also its velocity changes. The faster the parachute is going, the more the parachute is slowing you down. So in this case, many students made the error of thinking, ah, oh, this is gonna, this is supposed to have an M in it as well. So when they were doing this, they kind of introduced M with this um, air resistance where actually the question very specifically states that it does not have any M associated with it. So my forces are going to be um, you know, because it's mass times acceleration, um, I can say that's 80 times the acceleration, but my acceleration is in turn going to be equal to, uh, and I'm going to take the two accelerations from gravity and from air resistance, noting which one is positive. So I'm, this is a downward journey, so I'm going to call downward as positive. So that means that the 80g will be positive, and then the air resistance, the 0.2v, will be negative, so I get minus 0.2 V. Uh, and I guess I can divide through to get an acceleration equation, so that just gives me G, take away. Now 0.2 is uh, 1 over 5, so therefore when you divide by 80, you're going to get 1 over 400, so that gives me V on 400. So there was the first big error that a lot of students made, and it was tragic that it was so early on. We did award marks for students who made an error like that, and then everything else was fine, um, but often an error like that meant that it was very likely you made errors later on as well. Okay, this is the correct equation for acceleration, so how do I use it? Remember what we're trying to find. I want the velocity of the object after time t. And there's lots of different ways to say acceleration. We've seen this already even just in this paper. Which is the form of acceleration or which way of expressing acceleration makes it easiest for me to get to velocity as a function time. And hopefully it's clicking for you. I need to get this in terms of t. So I'm going to write acceleration as dv on dt. And this serves two purposes for me. Number one, the right hand side is in terms of v, so I can do my separation of variables and I can integrate to get that v out of it. But secondly, it's got it with respect to t, right? So when I integrate that part, you're going to get a t term out of it and then I can rearrange and so on, okay? So dv on dt is equal to g minus uh, g minus v on 400, but I notice actually it's probably going to be helpful for me because I'm about to integrate and I also have to turn things like reciprocals upside down and all that. I'm going to combine everything on the right hand side into a single fraction. It's going to be a bit of a mess, but that's okay. 
multiply that by 400. Uh, that's a minus V from the second fraction and that's all divided by 400. And now what I'm going to do is two things at once. I'm going to separate the variables out and then I'm also going to um, divide through or integrate through rather by each of the respective variables. Okay. Uh, what am I going to do? Well, um, I'm actually going to no, I tell a lie. There's one more thing I think that would help me to do to prepare this, right? I'm actually going to take out a minus sign. So that's going to leave me with V minus 400 G on the numerator. Um, another recurring theme, minus signs really, uh, you know, troubled people as they were appearing and disappearing throughout your working. The reason why this is going to be useful is because once I take the reciprocal of this thing, this fraction on the right hand side, um, it's going to be easy to integrate this with V as a positive rather than V as a negative as I had it there. Okay. All right, so let's do our separation. I'm going to get all my V's on the left, all my T's on the right, and then I'm going to integrate in one hit. Okay, so here we go. Uh, all my V's on the right, uh, left rather, so I'm going to go 400 over V minus 400 G D V. There you go, I've divided through by everything on this side, it's ready to go. And then I've got this minus sign still hanging around and a DT, and as promised I'm going to integrate everything all in one go. So I've got an integral on the left with respect to V, integral on the right with respect to T. And this is not complicated. I've set this up so it's quite nice. I can say this is going to be 400 because that's just the constant coefficient log of V minus 400 G on the left hand side and then minus DT in integrates up into minus T plus a constant. Um, and you know, bewilderingly, some people forgot this was an indefinite integral and you had a constant that you had to wor worry about. Um, this was an advanced idea that I guess we had forgotten about focusing on all the extension to stuff, right? So there we go. I've got um, this expression here and I'm going to need to find out what this constant is. How do I do that? Well, um, if you have a look back at the question, what's over here actually, you can see that this object of mass 80 kilograms, it falls from rest. So the reason why that's important is because it gives me an initial condition for velocity. The initial velocity must be zero. That's what falls from rest means. So therefore I can say, oops, um, when t equals zero, v equals zero. So therefore I can go ahead and I can substitute that in. On the left hand side I'm going to get 400 log of uh, absolute value of minus 400 g equals I'm going to get that minus zero there plus a constant. And at this point here I can say um, a couple of things. Um, firstly it's just my constant it's equal to 400 log and I noticed that um, I, I used absolute values here because I got it from this integration process. Um, I know what um, I've got a base of E, so I need a, a positive base means I've got to have a positive thing inside the log. And I know that G is going to be positive. Even if it's, I don't know whether it's 9.8 or it's 10, it's something positive. So therefore, I can just replace that with 400 G, because that's the absolute value of that. There's the constant, so therefore I can say, uh, let's pop that in, so 400 log of V minus 400 G equals minus T plus 400 log 400 G. Now, uh, from here I can then say, well, T is going to be equal to, and I'm going to subtract this term um, across to the other side, so it's going to give me, um, and I don't know why I dropped off my um, absolute value signs there, um, it's going to be equal to 400. I'll take that common factor out, log of, and when you subtract logs one from another, I'm subtracting this log from this one, that's equivalent to division, right? So therefore I can say that's actually V minus 400 G all divided by 400 G. Done. So there is T as a function of V. And uh, this is a really important point, right? Um, just making sure I got my order right here. T minus uh, V minus 400. Oh, no, I tell a lie. There's a minus t there. So now I'm actually going to say t equals, and I'm going to uh, multiply through by minus 1. So that gives me a minus on this side. I might, as, I might as well do this extra step for you. Make sure I don't skip anything here. So that's that. But that uh, minus 1 there can actually go up and become an index, right? So it actually flips this upside down. So that gives me, if I turn that positive, 400 log of, that's better. This is what I get for working things out beforehand. 400G minus uh, V minus 400G. That's time. Okay, there we go. 
happy. Now, here's the thing. Several students stopped at this point because maybe they felt like, man, I've done a lot of work. I integrated, did this diagram and everything. And uh, I've got, like I've evaluated my constant integration. It all looks nice. The only problem is just go back to the original question. It says, find the velocity of the object after time t. That's v as a function of t. Is that what we've actually worked out in my working over here? Do I have v as a function of t? And the answer is no. I have t as a function of v. It's the other way around. Um, this is t as a function of v, not v as a function of t. And a lot of students stopped at this point and just sort of, you know, went on to part two because you didn't necessarily need to, you know, work out what um, v as a function of t was to solve part two, even though it was in, in some ways easier. For me, and this is why it's worth three marks, I need to keep going. Okay, so what am I going to do? Um, I need to make v the subject. So I'm going to divide through by 400 to get this uh, log term by itself. Uh, that gives me all of this. Zoop. Uh, and then I notice that um, this is uh, base e, right? So in order to turn this log equation into something that gets the v separated out, um, I am going to turn this into an e to the power of, right? So therefore I can say this, um, this here, which is inside the log, is going to be e to the t on 400. Now I'm going to undo a trick that I pulled before with my minus t. I'm going to flip my, flat, my fraction back upside down, go v minus 400g on 400g. Uh, and if I've flipped the left hand side upside down, I'll flip the right hand side upside down, but it's easy to do that with indices by just applying a minus sign, minus t on 400. From there, um, I guess I just multiply through, so v minus 400g is equal to um, 400g outside of e to the negative t on 400. And then I'm going to add this to both sides, so you can see um, I get v equals, um, and you've got to be careful here by the way because um, there's a, uh, a minus sign that kind of crept out from in here when we applied that, that uh, absolute value. So in fact, when I came back out here, I'm going to return that there like so. Um, so there's a minus sign there as well. I'm going to add the 400g there, minus 400g e to the negative t on 400. And um, just to tidy things up, I will take a factor of 400g out, just factorize like so. So it's one take away that. Okay. And I'm done. At last, I've got v as a function of t, and that's where I can actually stop the question. We're getting close now. How do we get to part two? Well, um, what we're being asked for here is terminal velocity, and there's a couple of different ways to do it. Um, I think the simplest way is to say that the terminal velocity, it occurs when no more force is acting on the uh, on the particle on the object that's falling. It's an object of mass 80 kilograms, right? Um, so therefore, it occurs when there's no more acceleration. Um, if it was still accelerating, it would not be the final or limiting velocity. So I can say it's x double dot equals zero. And the attraction of doing that is I can go all the way back to my original equation, which is uh, g minus v on 400. That's my acceleration equals zero. Just go back to there, up the top. There, there it is, g minus v on 400, that's acceleration, right? So this is very straightforward. You can see why it was only one mark. Um, you can add v on 400 to both sides and you'll just get g, and then v, of course, is equal to 400g. There's another way you could have done this, by the way, if you just sort of um, cast your eye back to this line here. If you say, um, like, terminal velocity, the idea is it's the limit as t approaches infinity, as time progresses, right? That's what the limiting velocity is equal to. What do you get out of this particular expression on the right-hand side? Well, this term here, this term here has a minus t on 400 there. As t approaches infinity, um, this whole number is going to get enormous but negative, which means that this thing is going to go to zero, right? So therefore, you end up with uh, 400g times one minus zero, which unsurprisingly is just the 400g that we saw before. Either of those were fine. It was a bit sad, a number of students returned to x double dot equals like, you know, people use v dv on dx, uh, which dramatically increased the effort required. You could still get a valid answer. It was just really unnecessary. Okay, final part of the paper, if you can believe it, we're almost there. Part three, 
how far has the object fallen after time t? How do we do this? Well, like we saw before, we needed to, um, you need to do integration to get um, from um, this sort of uh, acceleration equation here up into a velocity equation and now I need to get to displacement. So I hope it's reasonably um, connecting in your brain that to go from velocity to displacement I'm just going to have to integrate again. Now I don't have to integrate twice. Some students did this as like a whole separate question, treat it as like, well, I better go back to acceleration and then off I go. But remember part one, you've already done one of the integrations. You've gotten from acceleration up to velocity. So let's use that, right? I can say from part one, I know that V is equal to, let's just go ahead and grab it, here it is. This is my velocity equation with an extra orange arrow coming along for the ride. And now to get to this, um, I can say, or rather to use this, I can say, well, that velocity there is dx on dt. It's the change in displacement over time. So therefore, uh, it's just a straightforward integration here, right? There's a 400g, uh, which is a constant coefficient hanging out the front, and then you're going to have t, um, because that's what your 1 integrates into. Um, and then just be careful here, right? You are going to have a subtraction from the original um, term here, but then you need to divide by your inside derivative. You're doing your reverse chain rule here, right? And your inside function here is minus t on 400, so you're dividing by minus 1 over 400. Dividing by minus 1 over 400 is the same as multiplying by minus 400. So that's that integration done right there. And then, close bracket, um, because this is an indefinite integral integration process, I've got another constant hanging around there, which I'm going to need to evaluate. Uh, let's tidy this up first. So I get a 400g, t plus 400. There's my exponential term. And here is this secondary constant that I need to evaluate. Now, same deal like we said before, right? I need some kind of initial condition here. And there's an initial condition that's implied, but it's not necessarily obvious to you. How far has the object fallen after time t? How far has the object fallen after time t? Now, let's just suppose we started from like, you know, 1,000 meters in the air, right? Well, if we fell um, to 900, um, all I'm interested in is the, is the gap. Right? I started 1,000, so I fell 100, now I've, I'm, I'm at 900, right? Well, if we started at, say, two kilometers in the air, 2,000, and then we fell 100, right? We'd be at 1,900, but those absolute numbers don't matter. All that matters is the difference between them. So therefore, I could just set that original number um, as not 1,000 or 2,000, I can just set that to something convenient to me. If it's something convenient, why don't I just set it as, set as x equals zero? Then I will simplify all my calculations and it will immediately give me what that difference is because there is no differential, um, there's no shift, right? So therefore I can say, consider starting point as x equals zero. So we've talked about this before as choosing a convenient origin. Often the origin is like the ground, right? But um, you can just as easily call the origin some point in the air if that's the starting point that's meaningful to you, okay? If my starting point is x equals zero, therefore I'm going to substitute t equals zero because that's the initial condition. So I get a zero on the left hand side, I get a 400g, and then in here I get zero plus 400, and then e to the power of zero is one, so I'll just write a one there, plus my constant. So hopefully you can see that second constant is gonna be uh, 400g times 400. Um, I could evaluate that, but I'm just gonna leave it as that because I'm about to substitute it back into this expression up here. And if the 400g has already been factorized out, well, I'll just leave it factorized out, right? I can say therefore x is equal to all of this stuff that we said before, zoop. I got an extra gravity on the way there, that's okay. And then when I add, I go to add my constant, right? It's 400g, which I've already got here, times 400. So there's gonna be a 400 also appearing in the brackets, and that's it. So, <laughs> well done if you got that far. It was a pretty tough paper overall, and lots of opportunities to really challenge yourself, but hopefully you learned something as you went through these questions.